So hello everyone, welcome to the monthly webinar series brought to you by Star Health Insurance and Secura Health. Uh, this is Dr. Diana Henry Selvraj, the clinical lead at Secura Health, and I'm thrilled to have you all here today as we delve into a topic that holds great significance in our current times. For today's webinar on caring for your lungs in the post-COVID era, we have we have super experienced doctors from Kaveri uh, Hospital, Dr. Srinivas and Dr. Nityanandan. We are privileged to have esteemed experts in the field of respiratory health joining us today. The COVID-19 pandemic has left an indelible mark on our lives and has brought the importance of lung health to the forefront. As we move forward into the post-COVID era, it becomes crucial to focus on the well-being and resilience of our lungs. Throughout this webinar, our primary objectives are to raise awareness about the importance of lung health in the post-COVID era, provide practical guidance on caring for your lungs, and equip you with the necessary knowledge to protect and strengthen your respiratory system. Towards the end of the webinar, we will have a dedicated question and answer se session. Your active participation is highly encouraged. Please feel free to submit your questions via the chat feature and our experts will address them. So, moving on. So, you all know the importance of lung care and we have our panelists to talk more about these. We have some trivia for you all to know. I'll, so I'm sure a lot of you might not know a couple of these. A left lung is smaller than your right lung to accommodate for your heart. And 70% of waste is eliminated through your lungs just by breathing. If the lungs were unfolded and expanded out to their fullest size, they would be roughly the size of a tennis court. And we don't have to think about breathing because the medulla oblongata, a part of the brain, triggers us to inhale. Most people only breathe through one nostril at a time. Some people notice that which nostril being used switches at sunrise and sunset. So moving on to our panelists of today. So we first have Dr. Srinivas Rajagopala with us. And he is a, uh, he provides comprehensive care for advanced lung diseases and has 19 years of experience in pulmonology. And he's, he's a student of uh, Jipma Chandigarh and um, Pondicherry. And he's also been in the Toronto uh, hospital. There are some areas of expertise, which uh, includes advanced lung diseases, heart and lung transplant, interventional pulmonology, sleep medicine, and pulmonology rehabilitation. So that's Dr. Srinivas for you. We also have Dr. Nithyanandan. So he is an expert in medical thoracoscopy and also uh, bronchial thermoplasty and lung cancer management, uh, in addition to a lot of other things. So uh, we have both our panelists here today. Before we move to our uh, panelist session, we will have a small quiz. So moving on to our quiz. So people who have answers can put it up in the chat, bo chat box. Um, the first question for today is how many gallons of air do you breathe each day? So anyone with answers, please feel free to put it up in the chat box. Do we have any answers? Okay, someone said between 2,100 to 2,900. So let's see if that's the right answer. It is. So let's move on to the next question, which is your breathing is controlled by, is it the lungs or the brain? So please feel free to put your answers on the chat box. Okay, so the answer was brain. And the last is, do you get asthma and bronchitis in your airways or your lungs? So we've got a couple of answers.
okay so we've got it right it's the airways moving on to the panel discussion for today how do we take care of our lungs especially for individuals who have recovered from covid-19 so i open the floor to dr shrinivas and dr nityanandan to take these questions so um See, for people who have recovered from covid the uh, you know uh, the, the two components one is specific to recent uh, covid illness and of course uh, general care of uh, lung health which is uh, specific which is like usual for uh, every anyone so f- coming to the first component after recovery from uh, covid it's important to know it's just that you know not an acute illness that you got over and then you went home because there is an entity which uh, uh, you know the lot has been uh, talked about called long covid also uh, in other words simplistically put there are people after a devastating critical illness can have residual deficits which can not necessarily only be deficits in the lung uh, you know related to scars formation but can also be overall health in terms of weight loss anxiety depression so so uh, such a devastating critical illness can affect person in multiple ways so it's important to know this getting home after you know hospitalization or a prolonged hospitalization for a critical illness does not end the story it's like rehabilitating them back to where they were before the illness started so uh, that is uh, my uh, specific take on the concept so you have to then look at it holistically whether you know how much of lung has been affected is there any residual fibrosis and that that, that is at several time points so Uh, which will essentially mean tests for lung function which can you know which can be physiological tests or anatomical tests not necessarily ct scans but actual lung function how much is it functioning how much you are able to walk and is it like uh, relative to your baseline is that right or is it improving or does it need more help and then structuring a rehabilitation program depending on what are the specific problems that are uh, you know seen there so after recovery it's important to come back and then uh, uh, you know visit your pulmonologist to have a systematic evaluation for this nitya you want to add anything also? yeah <clears throat> basically uh, you know whom so recover from covid uh, patients can could have suffered from a mild covid or a severe covid uh, generally mild covid patients uh, need not bother most of them will come back to their baseline activity within a uh, couple of weeks uh, while uh, severe covid patients who went into ventilator and uh, icu they will uh, take a longer time and those are the people who tend to have this long covid uh, much chances of having this long covid so they need to be a bit careful and they need to keep uh, track of how their lung function how they able to perform uh, and uh, they, they need obviously they need to uh, follow up with the uh, physician the pulmonologist uh, if they are not back to their uh, baseline activity within the, after that within the next uh, few couple of months or so I I'd, I'd like to add that uh, uh, you know overall the severity of uh, you know the initial disease is fine but also we see a lot of people who have persistent breathlessness cough yeah. even after you know like mild covid due uh, yeah. to several causes so uh, uh, a lot of them they may not have initially even proven they would have just assumed they had covid because somebody in the family had covid they wouldn't have even swabbed themselves and then they noticed for weeks together they, after the recovery they are not yet back to the baseline they not climb three flight of stairs that they were easily doing before uh, they get tired with the day to day work going to office so these are pretty common complaints for which there are good solutions so uh, it's it's important that you can meet a, a person who is managing this So doctor um do we see these um after effects only for those who had uh, severe covid or also for those who had mild covid that's a question i think uh, the general population has no uh, even mild patients can have uh, some types of stress uh, so the symptoms might uh, differ between those who had suffered from mild or uh, severe so some mild patients as i said pointed out maybe having persistent cough some amount of fatigability and uh, uh, poor exercise uh, tolerance and their ability to concentrate mental i mean uh, cognition anxiety those things can be then even patients suffering from mild covid and uh, it's like those things uh, anosmia uh, and uh, change in uh, taste not able to so those things can be there even in patients who have suffered from mild covid so sure. especially persistent cough and the feeling of fatigability these things can be there while the severe covid patient definitely they have because of the lung extensive involvement they will have more of a, a dyspnea breathing difficulty 
that is much more perceived by patients who have severe and obviously severe patients also who have multi organ involvement of heart and all those things so all those things are much more common in patients who have severe so sir, sir might may be able to add sure so that's what we were trying to answer with the last question as well so you know it's ultimately perception is very individualistic so you, you for an individual patient extreme fatigability uh, even after like very mild covid unable to cope up with day to day activities can happen after very mild covid they don't have to be on the ventilator for severe covid for that to happen so how they perceive that uh, is absolutely like very variable so overall obviously patients who are very sick to begin with and who are on a lot of oxygen who are on ventilator we expect them to have significant residual deficits say so they definitely need follow up whereas people who had mild if they are not back to baseline by the end of 4 to 6 weeks after the acute event they definitely need a review sure that i think is a wake up call for everyone who had covid to take care of their lungs so thank you doctors we'll move on to the next question which is what is exactly is long covid so we have been speaking about covid and long covid for a while so what exactly is long covid so generally if you have any symptoms which are persisting progressing or new onset after 4 weeks after an acute episode of infection in this case covid then the consensus is this should be labeled long covid it means it's an acute viral infection by definition by 4 weeks you should have completely recovered uh, so if it either persists beyond 4 weeks or there are new symptoms related to that after 4 weeks or you know it worsens after 4 weeks then we would call it long covid so long covid is just a constellation it is not something very unique or specific after covid it's just that after that with covid there are so many millions of people affected and there is uh, it is spread now very common but before this people after a viral illness uh, used to have it so we call chronic fatigue syndrome uh, that way, that at uh, that time so it's a well known entity it is not something that is unique to covid or otherwise after several viral infections it has been very well described after influenza say or other kind of uh, illnesses as well it's stuck a bit yeah so uh, uh so there are, since it's nothing specific it's like uh, you know holistic so there uh, it can it can be related to like extensive damage that happened during the acute episode it can be related to skeletal muscle reconditioning heart involvement uh, you know brain fog because patients are not able to concentrate uh, all of these are constellations so about 200 plus symptoms have been described mm-hmm. broadly you can classify them into cardiopulmonary neurologic endocrinologic skin upper nasal cough uh, kind of system and you know ab- abdominal symptoms so people have chronic diarrhea this thing and uh, those kind of things symptoms as well after so these are like how broadly and of course the sixth component is uh, g- g- fertility related so some people have persistent uh, g- gender urinary issues also after uh, okay so this this kind of constellation of uh, symptoms after the acute episode of uh, covid we we label them uh, long covid like i said it's not one unique mechanism it's also it's all sorts of things which can be uh, the in- inflammatory thing it can be just uh, the inflammation setting up some autoimmunity it can be blood clots during the time that happened it can be the residual effect of fibrosis or because of the severe acute illness and it there some anxiety depression component uh, as well and deconditioning so these are all put together but different mechanistic pathways are there uh, so systematically evaluating patients uh, may be important if they have residual symptoms at the end of 4 to 6 weeks leading up to what we said earlier so sure. they won't add anything hello <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah sir are already given a comprehensive thing of what is long covid yeah uh, yes some people say it is after 4 weeks some people say it is more than 12 weeks and uh, the other thing is uh, long covid is basically a, a thing of exclusion so we need to it's you have to rule out uh, the alternate causes of all the symptoms people would have recovered from a covid and uh, could have a new secondary event so we should not think it is just the covid which is causing all the symptoms so maybe the covid had uh, um uh, patient would have got a second uh, attack or uh, some uh, heart attack or something so uh, it's always you need to rule out the alternate causes before uh, diagnosing uh, this long covid and so that is something that is again well known like see after seasonal influenza episodes are closely linked to number of increase number of heart attacks in the community this is a very nice uh, paper in nigm published several years ago so similar kind of things are well known after covid as well so because of the inflammation there is a spike in the cases of heart attacks strokes happening uh, in the community uh, after you know a burst of covid wave so if you follow a wave uh, uh, or a you know spike of cases 
two to four weeks later, you will see that the number of heart attacks and strokes in yeah. the community have increased because of that. So, uh, you know, like uh, we would call them as well, you know, long COVID because it is, uh, you know, it has persisted uh, four weeks after it has happened after the acute episode. But uh, in general, these are things that happen in the community commonly as well. So, sure. there is an association between both events though. So anyone with any of these symptoms, I um, I would assume they should meet their health practitioner to make sure that it is long COVID and not anything else. Not and also people with risk factors for these common events, sure. primarily cardiopulmonary and respiratory. It means like somebody with known heart disease, stroke, and they're having now COVID, they can they should obviously they would have met the doctor at the time. But in general, they can also request the doctor to opine about anything else needs to be changed about the modification when they till the acute event is passed, like you know, uh, sure. in terms of adjustment and those kind of things. Yeah. And um, and doctor, uh, in your daily practice, how often do you see these uh, long COVID cases? So overall, my take is uh, roughly around ten to fifteen percent of patients after acute event will have uh, significant uh, long COVID, roughly. But it depends on sure. uh, you know the population uh, perception. Yeah. And those kind of things. Uh, Western population, their reports, uh, their numbers are maybe slightly higher than what we feel. Partly maybe because our uh, data is not less systematic compared to their, you know, like because our patients do not often come back to the same doctor. They may be going elsewhere. Also. So quite difficult sure. to sometimes make a robust. Sure. Thank you for those answers, uh, doctors. I think that was a very insightful, uh, you know, question and answer se- session. Uh, we'll move on to our next question. So, what is the impact of smoking and drinking on the lungs and how much is too much? So, I think we've been uh, going back and forth on smoking and drinking and the effects on uh, uh, overall health as well as uh, respiratory health. So, what is your take and what would you suggest? Do you want to take first, this first? Uh, I would say not to, to <laughs> drink uh, even a single uh, uh, pint of uh, alcohol or a single cigarette. Uh, there is not uh, there is nothing like a safe dosage of alcohol or a safe uh, cigarette thing even a single cigarette is harmful and a single uh, drop of alcohol is uh, harmful definitely so see so always say like uh, people uh, tend to associate uh, smoking with uh, more with lungs uh, so the awareness of what does alcohol cause on the lungs is not much uh, been spoken of but definitely uh, obviously everyone knows what smoking does to the lung you go to Theatres, you will display smoking kills, smoking causes cancer, all those things. But alcohol, they don't, they have so much pushes on the liver and all this stuff. But definitely, smoking causes all, uh, it's associated with a lot of uh, lung diseases, as you all know, like COPD, uh, Watson's asthma, and uh, ILDs, and malignancies, and cancers, and all stuff. So I don't put a specific number on what uh, number of cigarettes is safe for a lung. Definitely, I would not, for a general public, don't smoke. That's all. And uh, for the alcohol, definitely, uh, alcohol tends to lower the immunity in general of the patient. So definitely it predisposes to patients to get a lot of uh, uh, pneumonia. It's basically the predominant and also it tends to worsen. There's some certain substances can worsen the asthmatic, something asthmatics. It can uh, worsen the patient's immunity leading to uh, pneumonia, TB and uh, ARDS and all those stuff. And obviously by acting on the liver, obviously by indirectly it also affects, it has effects on the heart but indirectly they'll be affecting the lungs and uh, yeah. So, uh, so, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so basically smoking, uh, you know, like uh, is also not only active smoking, is also passive. So yeah. Smoking, uh, you know, I suppose alcohol, which basically affects you, smoking affects people in your vicinity as well. So new, uh, that is one important thing to remember and that is how, you know, if you remember uh, the ads displayed in the movie theaters, it's typically, uh, you know, to discourage people, uh, children in the family uh, are, uh, you know, come to the father saying, why are you smoking? Because it, uh, and that is factual because when children who have growing lungs are exposed to cigarette smoke, it definitely reduces lung growth and development, it leads to small lungs and leads to, uh, you know, chronic health issues when they become adults. The link may often not be visible at that time when they are adults because how often when somebody comes to you, do, you know, does your a doctor ask, did your father smoke when you were around? Nobody asks that, right? So, so this is uh, uh, an important un- unrecognized link as well. So, it's important to remember that, uh, you know, there's active smoking and passive smoking and both are equally bad. 
and the only cigarette that is safe is the one that is not smoked uh, uh, either by you or next to you so uh, th- that is uh, the thing and the thing about smoking is that there are not it has benign uh, in the sense that non neoplastic uh, complications as well as cancer related smoking ca- causes cancer is kind of now well recognized in yes. fact uh, before smoking became widely available lung cancer used to be a reportable disease means you would as a doctor see one or two lung cancers in your entire life it was such a rare thing but corresponding to the increase in smoking with world war 1 it the you know the incidence of lung cancer is now so much that you know uh, on an average day most pulmonologists would see one or two new lung cancers so that is the uh, amount of epidemic in even in india still 10% of the population to 12% uh, you know are active smokers and there is another uh, 15% who are farmer or you know independent smokers so uh, about 25% of our population have some tobacco uh, oral or inhaled uh, exposure so that is something that we need to work on the good thing is it is coming down Uh, but uh, it is probably uh, even you know like i said one is too, too much so we need to work on it um, sure. the other uh, thing about alcohol is that it also worsens other medical illness so it worsens diabetes worsens sleep disorders which are also uh, linked to uh, you know lung health so that, that is also uh, an important thing so in general uh, yeah, there is no safe uh, this thing so one cigarette basically reduces your life span by 11 minutes is the uh, usual kind of uh, thing so if you are happy taking 11 minutes out of your life uh, by all means please go ahead and smoke uh, is what i would say so yeah i would like to, yeah. like to have one point uh, recently the people uh, using uh, e cigarettes so even that is not safe Vape. So yeah it's not like uh, the, you switch to vaping or e cigarettes to okay. see uh, even that is even much harmful uh, equally harmful if not more uh, compared to cigarettes to your lungs yeah. don't uh, resort to electronic cigarettes to say yeah i think it's become more of a fashion statement now yeah. to be oh, not a fashion it's more it's harmful in fact harmful correct yeah. correct yeah and the, the effects of e cigarettes don't it, it won't wait for decades unlike yeah. cigarette uh, effects uh, you know you have young people coming with irreversible loss of yeah. lung function uh, you know sometimes waiting for transplant as well with e cigarettes yeah. so in india now it's not a problem because it's banned in india Yeah. but there are a lot of case series in the us and canada you know in canada during my time i uh, there were people who were vaping who ended up on the transplant list so it's a definite okay. problem there okay. right and uh, when smoking and we're talking about smoke there is no talk complete without you know the effect of air pollution so uh, right. and especially this is a problem in north india compared to south but of course it's a indian problem 23 out of the 30 most polluted cities in the world are in india and most of them are in the gangetic belt and when barack obama obama came to india for a three day visit uh, there was a lot of hue and cry because his uh, life expectancy reduced by 6 hours because he stayed three days in delhi right so uh, this is uh, you know but we uh, have a sedation yet to wake up and put strong uh, you know measures in place to because it's you know something that requires systematic change and takes time so uh, this is something that we have to be aware of especially people who have lung disease definitely they have to be aware of watch for quality of air avoid going out when air quality index is poor and if possible go to a place where the air quality index is safer compared to where it is not yeah doctors as you rightly said i think uh, the awareness for uh, smoking and cancer is uh, quite uh, significant um i'm i'm sure people who go to theaters have uh, you know have have the whole concept of uh, mukesh ingrained in their head so mukesh and oral cancer and smoking and everything is linked but uh, as is both of you rightly said i think it goes more than cancer and i think people should be mindful of uh, the other effects uh, in their uh, in their overall health as well So yeah um doctors i would like to ask another question uh, leading to this uh, so uh, what do you think is the effect of smoking and drinking on those who already have long covid likely to be cumulative so uh, you know like uh, uh, so you already have one damage to your lung so the question is like see i always tell there are two similar two organs in the body we don't use much one is our brains and second is the lungs so you, we hardly use 8 to 10% of our uh, brain capacity and lung capacity at rest we don't require because there's so much reserve uh, that we don't use so normally we breathe about 500 ml but the reserve is uh, you know close to 6 liters that you can use 
more you would use more about a 50 to 60 percent of that if you're running a marathon right but most of us don't run a marathon most days so we don't end up using most of the lung capacity so that's lying un- unused so unless you are losing lung function to about 50 percent you will not become breathless at rest and you will not know you're breathless unless you start running a marathon every day so that that is the amount of reserve that is there in the lung capacity so sure. you and because these cumulative defects are happening subtly there is some compensation happening it takes a long time for people to realize you know by the time they land to the doctor significant damage has already happened and these are all irreversible right so uh, this this is the problem the, the smoking as well as uh, superimposed so when somebody has a long covid related to structural abnormalities in the lung because of a severe episode of covid mm-hmm. and they have fibrosis uh adding another additional insult is likely to look, accelerate the loss of lung function uh, which will be permanent and leading to overall uh, you know irreversible loss of lung function and respiratory failure when lung capacity drops to less than 20% sure thank you doctors for that uh, moving on to our next question So are there any specific exercises or breathing techniques that can improve lung capacity and uh, strengthen our respiratory muscles I think a lot of yogics uh, have uh, you know made it very uh, popular that uh, yoga and exercise can actually improve lung function but how how true is this and what are the exercises that you you would would recommend from your practice I think I should take this one. Yeah, <laughs> I generally, uh, when people ask, uh, I generally give them two simple exercises. I tell them one is this uh, deep breathing exercise, which I tell them how you keep one is like, obviously, uh, you can one is you keep your one palm on your chest and other on your abdomen, basically, stomach, okay. basically. And then uh, you try to make the lower uh, uh, hand come up, basically, like uh, you breathe with your stomach. That's basically okay. deep breathing. So that is one thing. Uh, so you try to deep take deep breath with the lower hand coming up. So meaning this stomach breathing. That is one thing. The other thing is I ask them to personally breathing like you like you blow a candle. I mean uh, I ask them to take a deep breath and then uh, try to blow out a candle. You try to just try to I mean, like imitate like as if you are uh, uh, blowing a candle in a birthday. So those two okay. are simple exercises without any devices. You can I just tell them. if anyone uh, like uh, asked me like what the exercise you do uh, so i tell them to use them and uh, okay. machine i generally don't advise them to use all those uh, definitely there are there are devices available that incentive devices are available so i do generally don't advise them okay. unless they have underlying structural lung diseases obviously so if they have structural lung diseases so like uh, copd or bronchiectasis Uh, so then and uh, then there are specific devices which they can be uh, used and you can uh, also advise specific uh, lung rehabilitation uh, uh, breathing techniques uh, cyclical breathing techniques and all those uh, postural drainage and all those things that depends on the underlying structural uh, so, sir maybe okay no I, this is a very loaded question i often yeah. get asked so you know so i like to split uh, what i th- think about this like one is about sure. all this, this question in health yeah uh, so in people who don't have respiratory disease when you do uh, yoga or what or pranayama will it improve lung capacity and strengthen respiratory muscles is the question uh, so there are two components to this will it improve lung capacity and will it strengthen respiratory muscles uh, you know because lungs per se won't work unless you are you have the muscles around it contracting to expand the lung right sure. but lung capacity is determined genetically just like your brain capacity you can we cannot we can only change the number of connections that the neurons make we cannot make change the number of neurons itself right so uh, similarly the number of lung units are genetically determined and the only thing else which determines it negatively is early childhood events so if there is a lot of smoking biomass fuel exposure childhood necrotizing and pneumonias that will negatively affect the number of lung units but there is no way to get the unit up that is completely genetically determined so your lung capacity is genetically determined and of course modified by the environment around you so it's important to positively affect it by removing any possible negative determinants of childhood lung health so that is the one way to talk about lung but of course lungs per se will not you know are not only determinants the strength of respiratory muscles and how we train them can make them work more optimally so that way indirectly of course uh, you know lung up, lung strength and lung health can be better but lung capacity will simply not change just because you are doing yoga or otherwise 
sure. uh, and people in people with disease people with disease uh, due to any like can be like a post operative recovery or anything like that or people with asthma in them doing yoga how it will help us it will lead to more breath control so people who are breathless have a specific breathing pattern they do shallow breaths fast so which leads to the sense of breathlessness in them so by training them to take deep breaths whole breath breaths breathe out slowly through pursed lips we can reduce the sensation of breathlessness that these patients have which with to their perception will be an improved lung capacity but actually numbers will not change if we test formally but the sense of breathlessness will significantly change which is what we are trying to do as doctors to improve their Correct. you know breathlessness uh, and of course uh, some component of respiratory strength training also but it's a minor component uh, of addition what is more important uh, is of course uh, you know like uh, all these kind of uh, breath holding capacity and strength training also in addition does help but the you know uh, the addition is smaller compared to uh, respiratory breath hold training in cardio for example sure i think a couple of uh, uh, couple of members of our audience have uh, posted What's questions number? on the chat so we'll take those questions at the end of these uh, panel questions uh so anyone with any question can post it right now or whenever you want to ask them and then we'll take it up at the end so feel free to post them in the chat or in the q and a box so we'll move on to the next question so uh what are the specific foods or nutrients that are particularly beneficial for our lungs and for our respiratory health doctors so nitha you want to take this one uh, you can take it sir <laughs> okay so in in general like uh, uh, you will find on in the internet lot of curious data about this particular thing being helpful for lung health say green uh, you know you know uh, broccoli cauliflower or those kind of things and then some things which increase mucus uh, you know like milk or something like that. these kind of curious data on the internet to find is pretty common uh, but in general there is no specific association of a particular diet with lung health there is no proven data saying that eating this improves your lung function there cannot be because it is genetically determined um so uh, what is important of course is uh, to have a balanced diet so we have green leafy vegetables uh, and fruits in adequate proportion uh, you know along with uh, nuts all this is important for your overall health and because lung health is part of your overall health uh, you know in that way it holistically uh, a nutri- good uh, thing adequate hydration because dehydration also affects airways so you know balanced diet and uh, good hydration uh, maybe uh, this thing and then uh, in any opd on an any average day i will get asked one time i should not eat or drink milk no doctor because i have flem so i will put it here i uh, before somebody else asks in the chat box i will answer i'm sure i'm going to get asked about again about this again so maybe you should record it and play it back at the time but uh, definitely. definitely drinking milk or you know uh, curd this is not linked to excess of mucus production in majority vast majority of people so people you know who have asthma should not avoid milk should not avoid curd there is no association between that and wheezing or excess mucus production milk is often an essential uh, nutrient component for vegetarians where the you know, calcium and vitamin d uh, and protein intake of that adds significantly to the diet so not taking it may need to malnutrition and weakness indirectly so uh, in a very 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 small minority of patients there are certain you know like a uh, type of milk called the type a casein milk uh, you know that those people can have uh, you know uh, an increase in phlegm so it is consistent so every time you take you notice an increase in phlegm and you increase this thing then it makes sense not because a next door auntie told or you thought about it and you read in google so that doesn't really uh, you know make sense i think you rightly mentioned the two causes of these uh, rumors and these uh, you know uh, 
wrong facts uh, or i would say you know the, uh, the curd you should not eat curd if you have cold you should not eat uh, drink milk if you have cold i think two uh, you know sources of these rumors are uh, usually the women the uh, aunties like you may correctly mention and google so i think uh, that's where it all comes from so you rightly mentioned dr nithan and then do you have anything to add to that <laughs> yeah uh, basically if someone is healthy uh, you maintain a healthy lifestyle with a good uh, sir mentioned balanced diet is more important balanced okay. diet will uh, keep your uh, body mass index uh, proper and you will not get uh, any other issues related pertaining to the yeah, an unbalanced diet actually the other thing is if someone is an asthmatic or something so might someone something called food allergy is there uh, specific food allergies might be there so people tend to ask do i need to avoid certain foods to avoid uh, getting asthma attacks or something it is it's that if someone has an allergy to a particular food item specifically then you can avoid that unless uh, you don't presume you are allergic to certain substance you would avoid it there is nothing like presumption of uh, food allergy in avoiding it it is like if you are particular you have an uh, you have a food you are multiple multiple times you have experienced that food is specifically uh, triggering your attack then you you can uh, presume it and you can but otherwise you don't presume and avoid uh, certain foods even for asthmatics unless you have an experience of an attack uh, following that food sir yes. anything to add sure. yeah no no specifically uh, i wanted to add that when he meant food allergy he didn't mean curd and milk yeah yeah exactly that's he what he meant very specific things like uh, prawn yeah. uh, nuts Yeah. um seafood and uh, he meant uh, you know yeah. like uh, um, um msd or uh, you know monosodium glutamate very specific things specific meant. food items sure. so, uh, so that's what so don't presume things and avoid uh, things which are essential in fact to your body so if someone comes with a presumed allergy uh, what would be the next step from your side doctor to confirm that this is what is the allergen and this is what they should avoid Like take a detailed history to see really if it is allergy or not. Like often uh, people think they are allergic and then uh, they will say all sorts of things. But when you really ask them what happened, then a okay. lot of other things would have been uh, thing. They would have had some itching and they thought that that was related to it. So take to first step to really dissect out what they thought was the event and whether that event was significant. See, for example, somebody went out uh, outside to a hotel and then they had seafood and then they developed. swelling of the neck or breathlessness and at that time a lot of hives uh, skin reactions were there then that's a definite you know event so and then they often may have been severe enough for them to come to emergency to take treatment so if that is so significant that so and what was so severe then we would never challenge again we would say okay you need to avoid uh, the we we do have tests to confirm some of these which we can uh, do either by uh, you know a skin prick test which we commonly do in our opd or a, a blood test uh, okay. so these are two important things so for certain antigens we do have uh, immunotherapy as well we can make people decent tests for example abroad you would have commonly heard hay fever is a common diagnosis so people uh, you know have uh, allergy to uh, particular uh, agricultural products and then it's common during season pollen exposure they get uh, episodes of urticaria rhinitis and other things so it's easy to desensitize them uh, you know if it's a particular single antigen and there is a temporal association noted so sure. we have desensitization can be done orally where we give them uh, graded doses increasing doses of uh, oral immunotherapy sublingually which they can take at home every day Uh, and then or we can give it once a month as injections so either can be done and we are doing that uh, on a day to day basis in our hospital uh, several patients uh, you know who are on for years together on montecalci or whatever or anti allergics have all gone off and done extremely well while on immunotherapy though it's this is however not a magic cure doesn't work for everybody it works 70 to 80% of the time and uh, it does take 3 to 6 months for the effect to kick in often most people need to be on yeah. that for about 2 years at least for a to sustain uh, and give a long term result so there are caveats to it but uh, you know this is how we usually proceed in our uh, outpatient department sure doctor and one le- uh, last leading question to this uh, specific question is that 
both of you doctors mentioned that uh, we should take a balanced diet so balanced diet might sound different or might be perceived dif- differently uh, by different people right so one person might eat a plate of eight idlis and call it balanced and one person might eat 10 idlis and call it balanced or probably uh, two cups of rice and it could be different uh, so according to you what is a balanced diet no no we did not mean uh... balanced in the sense that leaving a plate uh, does not let you, uh, you know let it fall on the floor we meant balance in terms of balance of carbohydrates proteins nutrients uh, minerals vitamins in that way so um, so uh, in terms of calorie content it should be appropriate to what your weight is and your age is so if you eat excess of calories you're going to have uh, you know your sugar going up cholesterol going up so that is uh, you know restriction on calories typically not more than 25 kg per kg per day uh, i have protein adequate protein intake roughly depends on you know your age again but then typically 0.7 to 1 g per kg uh, protein uh, balance a diet which is which has all the essential uh, vitamins which is uh, you know a d e k uh, and the b complex vitamins and then also some minerals which are essential like potassium sodium uh, so we meant balanced in the sense of a holistic diet which has all the essential things these are essential for your body to replenish every day because there is a loss of these every day in terms of utilization so when the body uses these minerals and vitamins for day to day processes it it loses a bit of it every day so you sure. need to replenish that by taking a diet which is you know balanced and that's the reason we eat right so because you need energy because you've lost energy for day, due to daily processes um just like you know a computer using up electricity so yes sure thank you doctor for that moving on to our next question okay so what should individuals with pre existing respiratory conditions such as asthma or uh, copd do to protect their lungs and manage their conditions effectively in uh, this post covid era Yeah, uh, so, uh, basically, uh, management of these patients who have asthma and COPD, I mean, like, it's same as in the pre-COVID era. They basically, you're not going okay. to do anything. You are going to com- continue taking your inhaler, just continue okay. keep following it with your uh, doctor. Don't skip your medications. And uh, if at all you are not vaccinated for COVID, after three months, get yourself vaccinated for the COVID. If you are left your uh, precautionary dose, get the, those things vaccinated. And according to your uh, criteria, if you are fit for another uh, flu or a pneumococcal shot, get your vaccinated for that also sure. and uh, you follow uh, your other uh, covid precautions if you're still in the covid uh, uh, because you are having uh, intermittent outbreaks so you follow the same uh, precautions as any other people but obviously the issue with these people are like uh, many of the symptoms which the asthmatics and copd patients experience they mimic uh, symptoms of covid and also they can mimic the uh, patients with this uh, long covid which we had discussed uh, recently so they can have uh, intermittent episodes of breathlessness and cough and uh, this thing so we need to have a close watch on them they need to be able to differentiate they are not able to differentiate obviously they need to consult the practitioner okay so, and doctor you mentioned uh, flu shots right so who yeah. is this flu shot for is it for all of us or yeah it's for everyone including uh, healthy individuals it's to be given okay. for everyone uh, every year yeah but especially for asthmatic covid it's must but it's for everyone uh, every year it has to be taken right so uh, so like what uh, dr nitya was saying uh, in addition uh, you know we are uh, we have been and we are going to have uh, episodes where the covid numbers will go up yeah right? so there will be spike in cases with new variants coming up and for the foreseeable future that is what is likely to happen just like how it has been happening with influenza so with influenza when there are minor cha- changes in the genetics of the virus there are years when the number of cases go up and there are years most years when the cases are low if there is a new variant completely new variant for which the population has no immunity then you have a very bad year say for example in 2009 when we had a influenza variant which we call h1n1 now swine flu Uh, emerged on the scene the population did not have immunity so there were literally lakhs of patients with influenza at that time so uh, this is just like covid so it's a resp- common respiratory viral infections are several in the community so for, of which covid is now one influenza is one we also have respiratory syncytial virus metanumo viruses and 
you know, a whole lot of other viruses, rhinoviruses. So there are umpteen number of viruses going around in the community. From the population's perspective, if you are healthy, if you, you know, don't have pre-existing respiratory diseases, the chance of you having a bad viral pneumonia is very, very remote. But if you do have a comorbid condition like a comorbid cardiorespiratory disease, and for that I meant significant COPD, a well-controlled asthmatic would strictly not be a, a, a at risk for any of these. But whereas a patient with poorly controlled asthma, severe asthma, significant COPD, like you know, ongoing smoking, cardiorespiratory diseases would be at risk for a bad outcome with any of these infections. So when you talk in terms of population, when you want to you know, have a good, uh, you, you want to like vaccinate the, the, the at-risk population first. Think about what happened when we had very little vaccines and then you had COVID happening. The people who are targeted first were the people who are most likely to get it. Healthcare professional, people who are more than 65, people who had COVID, COVID, these are the people who are vaccinated first, right? Not the general population. When these people are vaccinated and then you had vaccines to spread then the general population was given. So same principle appears for every respiratory viral infection for which we have vaccination. For the rest, you just have to do what you're doing when you have a COVID wave. So what should we do? We should just, when the numbers of respiratory viral infections are going up in the community and how will you know that? You will know that if the next door person is coughing a lot or if your family, lot, your children are starting to cough after school. So these, this will mean a, a spurt in cases is going on at any okay. point of time, typically after the rainy season or in the cold season, especially. So this is when you should be aware of these things. So if it does happen, then what we need to do is to, you know, mask up at the time, do social distancing with people who are coughing, hand washing, make sure your vaccination is up to date and self-isolate if you have problems. So these things, five things that we did during COVID are true for any respiratory viral infections. Sure. Thank you, doctor. Moving on to the next question. I think uh, we've got a lot of uh, audience questions as well. So we'll uh, move by quickly. Okay, so can a person with asthma engage in exercise? I think it is a common misconception that uh, anyone with asthma, including children, should not be uh, active in sports, should not be actively involved in any exercise. So is that true? No, no, a patient can, asthma can exercise, definitely. In fact, they should exercise. Unless uh, it's, it's the other way around, you should exercise. They should not uh, stop exercising. Uh, they can uh, involve in all sports activities uh, similar to others, other any other uh, individual. But the thing is, uh, sometimes uh, asthma can be, uh, if the patient have uh, well-controlled asthma, uh, asthma is well-controlled with the medication or the inhalers prescribed by the pulmonologist, they can uh, take the regular dose of inhalers and they do, go along with their act usual activities. But certain precautions are that they should be aware of symptoms of asthma attacks. Sometimes okay. uh, during uh, sports activity or uh, exercise, they can uh, have an asthma attack. So it's something called exercise induced asthma or something. So, so if they are experiencing such attacks uh, frequently, then uh, they need to report to the physician and they may need to take the inhaler uh, additionally, like 15, 20 minutes before the, they are going to go for exercise. That is okay. one precaution they can do. And the other thing is try to avoid uh, exercising in uh, like a dusty environment uh, when it's so cold in the humid too early in the morning in the winters or avoid uh, exercising in polluted uh, uh, weather and uh, try to always warm up not to rush into exercise and you ought to always stop whenever you feel uh, breathless during exercise and when sure. you feel it's an attack take uh, the inhaler immediately keep your inhaler with you all the time so there are certain precautions otherwise uh, you can uh, do exercise Sure. And one question, doctors. Uh, so uh, for those like uh, Dr. Srinivas had mentioned in uh, one of the previous questions. So uh, for those in areas like Delhi, where the air quality is actually really low uh, and they already have asthma. So what can they do to, you know, uh, prevent any exacerbation or how, how to how, how should they protect themselves from making it worse? So uh, in terms of exercise or you mean in general? In general. Okay, in general, what we can do is to make sure your asthma is well controlled to begin with by okay. adhering to medications well and to have a clear plan with your doctor to what it, what to do when it doesn't, when the symptoms are going up. So if you tackle it when it's slightly going up, it's easier to manage when compared to a full-blown episode. So that we call an action plan. So have okay. to have well-controlled symptoms and to have an action plan when symptoms are not well-controlled and to know when clearly you need to meet your doctor. So this is a, a basic thing. 
also to make sure that we don't do some things like we've already talked about like no smoking and uh, for example also to know when the air quality index is bad so if the area that you're working to that day has an aqi of 350 which is in which it is on a very good day in delhi most of the days it's 500 plus so you will then try and avoid work on that day and try to do remote work probably that is uh, okay. you know and if it's absolutely un- unavoidable then wear an n95 mask at least when you're going off in those areas that's what i would suggest sure thank you doctor so moving on so this is for the general public right so are there any tests to assess uh people's uh, lung health or lung function so for a, for a normal person uh, who's listening in so what should they do to assess their lung health i'll, I'll go for this one uh, so see it's uh, it's like lung health is not like one number like um, a diabetic sugar uh, which is like you know you're targeting one particular number so lung health is a holistic thing so um in general if you look at uh, lung uh, how do you assess lung you can assess lung by different ways so you can assess your lungs by how much volume they have that is one common way we do like if your lung because lungs are basically cylindrical structures uh, you know slightly tapered epically which are filled with air so how much of air is filled in your lung will give you a capacity but that is not only one that is just one dimension the amount of air in the lung which is will only be important if it is matched to the amount of blood going into the lungs at the time only then that matching will lead to oxygen getting into the blood and that gain getting carried to all over the body which is essentially what the lungs are doing they are basically getting oxygen into the blood uh, and matching it with the blood flow and sending it out to the heart which then pumps out all the oxygenated blood to all parts of the body then the uh, you know the oxygen poor blood comes back to the lungs for the same process to happen all over again so this is what is happening in the lung so we can not only assess the amount of capacity in the lung but also whether that is being matched to the amount of oxygen diffusion capacity of this particular lung and whether that is you know any matching is happening or mismatching is happening then we can of course assess the third component which is how efficient are your respiratory muscles working we can also assess this globally in terms of your skeletal you know because activity at these are all tests which can be done at rest but what is important is we cannot you know most diseases will not be evident when it's at rest you need to stress the system to find out like for example when you have chest pain and then you go to a doctor it is unless it's happening at rest if it's happening on and off intermittently then your doctor will say please go get a treadmill test done that is because he's stressing your heart to see if you know chest pain is happening or ecg changes are happening at the time the same is true for lungs so you could do a, a stress test which in this case is called a cardiopulmonary exercise test so uh, so these are the ways in which uh, you can do of course uh, certain specific diseases for example related to like you said you breathe because your brain tells you to breathe in the in the quiz question so the, the neural control of breathing is also another component that can be tested so uh, so many components uh, have to be looked at when you're having a specific problem uh, even for example low hemoglobin in the blood means not enough oxygen carrying capacity is there when that is essentially a blood test and how much of oxygen is there in your blood is also an indirect effect of how much your lungs are working so the test the choice of test would depend on how serious and severe your problems are if it's very mild then you don't need this test where the lung is failing you need test to pick up very mild symptoms then you choose a more holistic or a more uh, a test of vital capacity but if your lungs are failing then you would then check your oxygen capacity so people often these days after covid thing they put on a pulse oximeter numbers are 99 my lungs are good nothing can be further from the truth your numbers will be 99 till 30% of your lungs are working right if your lung capacity falls less than 30% then the numbers will start to fall so uh, saturation does not mean good lungs you okay. need to you know look at measures of lung function the the simplest test that we usually baseline test that we perform is called the spirometry which basically means how much of capacity air capacity you can move in and out of your lungs so it's a test not only of your lungs but also the respiratory muscles which will move air in and out of the lung so that is the basic test that we would do for most people to screen with to see if you have any major lung issues along with this we can do another test called diffusion lung capacity which will basically mean how much of oxygen your lung is getting into the blood so these are the two screening tests we will do the third screening test is a holistic test we call we make how much of you know what distance can you move or walk about in 6 minutes at the level at your own speed 
and does this associated you know is does this have any fall in oxygen levels and how is your heart rate and blood pressure behaving this we call a 6 minute walk test so these are the three basic tests we would usually do to do to assess the lung sure. function Sure, doctor. Thank you. And uh, I think a very common problem among the general public is snoring. So, at what point uh, should people actually come and visit their pulmonologist? Um, because there are light smoker uh, snorers, there are uh, heavy snorers. So, uh, at what point should they be worried? At what point should they come for a test? Yeah, you want to take this one? Yeah. <clears throat> yes, so, so uh, basically, the things to look at are uh, whether they have a refreshing sleep. So. Uh, Uh, having uh, so one is uh, patients do have uh, early morning uh, uh, they don't have a feeling of refreshness the other thing early morning headaches and uh, daytime sleepiness feeling of uh, feeling sleepy simple activities when they're sitting idle in front of computer or traveling short distances car travel or those uh, sleepiness basically that's called the habitual day, uh, habitual snorers and okay. excessive daytime sleepiness early morning headaches a uh, lack of feeling refreshing in the early morning these are symptoms you see just immediately go and cons- uh, consult the thing the other thing people obviously you, you, you need not have all these symptoms in every patient who has uh, this thing that is the uh, caveat of these things because these are all typical symptoms but typical symptoms may not be there in everyone some patients may just have uh, like uh, yeah, concentrating like they'll have just uh, this, they will just present with the uh, uh, the like complications related to this they will end up straight away with breathlessness heart failure uh, and they will just have shortness of breath so those things mean that this is already in advanced stage also they will have some subtle symptoms irritability concentrating so lot of uh, other symptoms can be there so which obviously they need to consult so just to share up just to clarify and add two lines so all these points are uh, you know everybody should realize about uh, snoring so snoring is pretty common in the com- community 50% of men will snore in the community uh, and not necessarily all of them uh, you know like are are abnormal uh, it can be simple snoring especially among habitual snorer snorers which is typically 20 to 25% in the male population slightly lesser in the women population uh, there is a strong link between weight and habitual snoring so if your bmi is definitely more than 23 there is a strong link of uh, that happening on top of that you know if you you are not your body is not able to compensate and then you you your because of weight and other anatomical morph, uh, you know appearance of the upper airways what we are worried about is called obstructive sleep apnea that is because of your weight the upper airway is closing when you go to sleep that is what leads to problems because your air is not flowing into your lungs and oxygen is not flowing into the lungs and cyclically oxygen is falling which wakes you up from a deep sleep to a superficial sleep and then that leads to restoration of oxygen which again puts you back to sleep which then starts the cycle all over again so this we call obstructive sleep apnea this is very common in the community again 10% of the male population again 4% of the female population has obstructive sleep apnea most people are not aware of this problem if you ask people about diabetes and asthma they will know but they won't know about sleep apnea but it's a very common problem in the community especially as the weight of, of an average indian increases you know typically uh, you know because uh, as a poor country but as a social demographic sing, uh, change we find obesity a, as a common problem so as this increases this is going to be a bigger problem in the future like dr nityanandam said there will we we'll only often diagnose this when people present with either excessive daytime sleepiness or a complication another important complication is hypertension so if you are young less than 40 years and you have hypertension it's very likely that is because of sleep apnea 50% of them will have sleep apnea so this is another uh, situation another important situation is uh, you know like pulmonary hypertension that is again come. this is on the hypertension is on the left side and uh, pulmonary hypertension is the right side of the heart pressure going up in the right side of the heart both of which happens in sleep apnea so uh, it's important to be aware of this and then if you have people if you have they are having excessive uh, your daytime sleepiness or unable to concentrate that are very early symptoms then that should be evaluated sure Uh, that was really insightful thank you doctor so we'll move on to the audience question uh, questions because uh, we're running out of time uh, okay so we've got a lot of questions from our audience the first one is from archana so she's asking after covid does it affect heart uh, i've got persistent coughing and mucus forming so how to heal this yeah covid affects virtually every system in the body and heart is one of the uh, you know well known a uh, pe- lot of people have significant heart uh, you know either people myocardial infarction heart attacks are linked to covid and of course heart pumping cardiomyopathy 
is also well uh, you know known and i've had patients uh, many after covid uh, in several of these cases this does recover but in some it does not it often uh, they have dilated cardiomyopathy after covid so uh, uh, you know in some people it has been so bad that they were needed to have a transplant afterwards so the severity of course like in all not all covid is bad some covid is mild so some people will recover some uh, you know it's a link between not only the initial severity of infection but also the inflammation that happen in your body so uh, covid does affect the heart so that is the answer to the first component second component is uh, persistent cough and cold especially after omicron a lot of it is upper airway related not necessarily your lung so it's important to see your doctor to see what component is affected and uh, sure. test your lung capacity and see if it's related to sinus before Uh, not necessarily to go to the chemist and ask for some tablet for cough or cough syrup but to really assess yourself sure so uh, the next question is from uh, jitender kashyap so he is asking um his question is i probably had mild covid in 2020 and i have an urge for deep breathing quite frequently my oxygen levels are quite okay around 95% is there anything to worry all right i think the second part we already answered oxygen capacity of 95 one is not normal second oh. oxygen capacity being normal does not rule out lung disease so uh, uh if you only had mild covid the chance of you had significant fibrosis in your lung is pretty small but if you did have covid and you still have symptoms it's an indication for doing lung function testing which we already talked yeah. I think that question is answered. So moving on to the next question from uh, Salim Syed. So he says, "I've had a heart attack recently in Feb 2023, and I had severe COVID in 2020 August. So is the heart attack because of severe COVID? In this case, no. No, no. Three years. Like okay." So I think we have an answer there. So the next question is from Lakshmi. So, sir, ground glass opacities are seen in asymptomatic patient. What would be the reason? ground glass opacities on the ct basically means you know uh, it is increased in attenuation it's, it's whiter than usual whiter that's all ct has two colors only black and white right you cannot have third color so that is why it, uh, any abnormality in the lungs basically will be either more black or less black so uh, which, there are a whole lot of conditions 20 odd plus conditions which can cause all of these increased whiteness of which one is covid Right. There are a whole lot of other conditions, so do not get carried away by, uh, you know, some CT report showing some ground glassing. Or half the time when you review it, uh, you know, it may not be significant, or it may be significant in another disease. So uh, you need to see a pulmonologist. This is uh, something that uh, Google should not be uh, sorting out. Sure, great. So we'll move on to the next question from uh, Bharathi Ramakrishnan. So. The question is: It would be beneficial if peripheral conditions like anxiety attacks, dehydration, dropping of electrolytes, especially in summers in dry north, transient allergic conditions, which turn minimal breathing issues into severe pulmonary conditions, can also be described. Even for those who are in office, uh, suffer from extreme dehydration, sunstrokes, etc., which can aggravate breathing issues. So she wants us to talk a little more about dehydration, especially in summer. We did talk about adequate hydration and yeah. balanced diet in terms of lung. Yes, we did. Uh, and in tropical countries, of course, sun protection and uh, risk of sunstroke, while well, it's very hot, like how it is in Chennai these last couple of days again. So uh, to be aware of, but also the risk of sunstroke is more. Uh, in conditions which are less humid compared to chennai so we do we can while we can get some stroke in chennai the risk of it actually getting here is much lesser than what say for example you will get in jaipur so uh, where you have a more dry climate uh, so uh, uh, it's in the office adequate hydration is more important it's very unlikely you will get some stroke within the office this is something that it happens when you go outside when it's very warm and then you're overdressed for that condition or you're doing extreme amount of physical activity generating heat uh, where your body doesn't have enough capacity for the heat to dissipate so uh, just to be aware of it will solve this problem and uh, of course uh, it's something that uh, you know is part of our life so that that is something that uh, i think i most able to address uh but there was also a first component uh, a common ill so see uh, viral infections are uh, you know part and parcel of our day to day activities before covid almost nobody bothered about this uh, they were you know we did have waves on and off we did have lot of influenza say in 
which was a bad year right i did have, i did run a lot of ecmos in 2017 for influenza but uh, you know on the community almost nobody knows about it but uh, these are this will continue to happen so viral infections for the mass majority 99.9% will be mild most of us will get two to three viral infections because most of us have kids going to school uh, and they will bring from other kids they will come and give it to you and you are likely to get it uh, you know because we cannot wear mask all the time at home as well so in mass majority it will get better and what is important is to know what are the warning signs so if you are having breathlessness you are having persistent cough up to several weeks you are feeling very fatigued then these are the warning signs which is when you need to go to a doctor thank you dr shneema so i we have one last question so does covid have an impact on hp levels most covid patients uh, report with anemia nitya you want to take that one oh no, <laughs> basically uh, the thing is uh, covid uh, can cause uh, no basically anemic patients tend to have they do due to tend to have a severe uh, covid yeah, there has been uh, this thing and the other thing is uh, anemic patients tend to have symptoms of uh, breathlessness fatigability which can mimic uh, like uh, symptoms of uh, long covid that is another thing uh, so those are the two things uh, yeah i don't know whether that it directly causes uh, leads to anemia i don't know maybe sir not specifically covid but the observation is right in this instance yeah. when you have an acute severe uh, illness of any sorts you know your, it interferes with your body's ability to, to put iron into hemoglobin so there is a resistance uh, to hemoglobin formation because there is a normal turnover in red blood cells it does lead to a brief abrupt cessation of new hemoglobin production which will last till the acute event results so when the acute event results and the body is recovering from it it will go back to normal so finding anemia at that point does not mean anything for example if you had kids and they had a bad viral infection at the time when somebody is done a cbc you will notice that they had anemia at that time but afterwards when you looked at it uh, it will gone back to normal so uh, so it's important to follow it up to make sure it's gone to normal if it is not a uh, media or general physician or uh, internal doctor intermittent and doctor to make sure uh, what what is happening a lot of for example you would have never checked your hemoglobin before yeah, is- and uh, for the first time you know that's when you picked up and then it persisted you it may be for example you had thalassemia trite or whatever we don't know so it needs to be assessed so thank you doctors uh, so i think that's it from the audience uh, it was a very very insightful uh, session for everyone out there if you have not uh, looked after your respiratory health uh, so far i think now is the right time and especially if you have had covid i think uh, you guys have to be even more careful and if there's any question the best person you should reach out to is your uh, general practitioner or your pulmonologist uh, to make sure that everything is fine and also have a balanced diet drink adequate water and exercise and stay healthy so thank you dr shrinivas thank you dr nityanandan thank you for that uh, session i think it was very really helpful for a lot of us thank you and see you in the next webinar